the places that this nerve has to travel sound like they were taken straight from a Halloween movie. Hello humans, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, which is all about eyeball situations and in particular cranial nerve three, we're gonna be doing some cranial nerve pearls. Be sure to click that link for your handy download. It's gonna be an absolute blast. And this video follows on beautifully from last week's video where we covered Horner's syndrome. So if you haven't already, be sure to check that out first chance you get. Okay, so first things first, a very quick revision of the cranial nerves that control eyeball movements. I like to use the LR6 SO4 memory aid. Lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve 6 and it moves the eyeball outwards or laterally, whilst cranial nerve 4 innervates the superior oblique muscle which moves the eyeball down and out. And cranial nerve 3, also known as the oculomotor nerve, innervates all of the other eyeball muscles. It's responsible for all other movements in all other directions. And cranial nerve 3 is also responsible for opening up the eyelid and it also carries parasympathetic fibres which promote pupil constriction. Now don't worry if you don't know a lot about cranial nerve 3, we are going to get so acquainted with this little nerve today, I can't even. Okay, so don't worry, the whole purpose of today's video is to help you remember the eyeball situations so you can actually apply this knowledge to your exams and doctor life. So stay with me. So let's check out cranial nerve 3 in all its glory. Cranial nerve 3 starts its journey in the brainstem, more specifically the midbrain. Here it starts at its nucleus and then moves through the fascicular region. And then after that, things get rather scary. The places that this nerve has to travel sound like they were taken straight from a Halloween movie. So after leaving its little brainstem house, Cranial nerve 3 must embark on travelling through the subarachnoid space. Could there be a more scary name for a place? And then, once it comes out of the subarachnoid space, it then has to travel through the cavernous sinus, which, let's be honest, doesn't sound like much of a better place. So. Cranial nerve 3 has left the brainstem and it has to go through the subarachnoid space and then the cavernous sinus and when it comes out of there it comes out running and it actually divides into two. Some of it runs up the eyeball hill and the rest of it runs down the eyeball hill until it gets to its little muscles around the eye and the eyelid where it controls eyeball movements and all the things. And we said before that in addition to innervating most of the eyeball movement muscles, cranial nerve 3 also innervates the upper eyelid and it carries parasympathetic fibres to the pupil which promote pupil constriction. Now this pupil abnormality can vary and we'll circle back to the pupil in just a tick but I wanted to pause there and hand over to you for a puzzle. Okay, so you have a cranial nerve 3 palsy on the right eye. I want you to complete this diagram by downloading it and dragging and dropping all the little eyeballs to their correct location. Or you can just draw it out. So hit pause, do that for me, and we'll feed back in just a tick. So how did you go? I find the easiest place to start is by acknowledging that the fourth and sixth cranial nerves are still working. And so they are going to be pulling this eye in their direction out and down. And so in the resting position looking straight ahead we have this down and out appearance to that right eye that is affected by the cranial nerve 3 palsy. And we also have ptosis, eyelid droop. So you might actually have to lift the eyelid to see what's going on with the eye. Then when we try to move the eye the left eye is doing its thing. It's totally normal full range of movement and on the right we're not getting much action when it comes to trying to move the eyeball because all of the other movements are affected. So in a cranial nerve 3 palsy you will have ptosis always and issues with eye movements in most directions and sometimes you will have pupil dilatation 
and sometimes you won't. So what's the deal with this pupil? Why is it so variable? And this is super easy. Let's explore that now. So apparently, the way the nerve is organized, the motor component of the nerve runs inside the deep core of the nerve and its blood supply is from the vasonervorum, which basically means little tiny blood vessels that penetrate the nerve and shimmy into the inside of the nerve and supply blood inside the nerve. The parasympathetic fibers, on the other hand, are organized towards the outside of the nerve and their blood supply is different. They receive blood from the pia mater, which sounds so familiar, yet so unfamiliar at the same time. But Google reminded me that the pia mater is a thin layer of connective tissue that sort of hugs the brain and the spinal cord. And it is also just chalk is full of little capillaries supplying blood to various parts as it hugs the brain. So cranial nerve 3 motor fibers deep within the nerve are supplied by the vasonervorum which are ultimately smaller branches of the arterial circulation to the brain. Whilst the parasympathetic portion of this nerve travels on the outer portion and is supplied by the pia mater capillary situation. And what that means is that some causes of cranial nerve 3 damage will lead to pupil dilatation and some will not. And now that we know what we know, this is super easy. Think about it. If you have an ischemic insult to this nerve due to atherosclerotic disease in downstream vessels, that is going to affect the motor component of cranial nerve 3 very much so, right? The blood supply of the core of this nerve will be interrupted. But the parasympathetic fibers that control the pupil, they remain happily supplied by blood that's coming from the surface of the nerve, from those capillaries in the pia mater. But on the other hand, if we had a space occupying lesion or an aneurysm or trauma to this nerve, then that's going to very much impact the parasympathetic fibers on the outside of the nerve. In fact, those fibers are first in line to take a hit. And you can see how the ischemic type causes can be regarded as medical, whereas all of these other pathologies such as aneurysms, space occupying lesions, tumors, all the things, they're more surgical territory, right? So we have medical causes and we have surgical causes. And the medical causes, we have a normal pupil. And on surgical causes, we have a dilated pupil because that's pressing on those parasympathetic fibers. So when it comes to cranial nerve three lesions, everyone will have ptosis and eye movement abnormalities. And some people will also have pupil dilatation because of the loss of parasympathetic innervation to the pupil. And those people with the pupil dilation may have a surgical cause, meaning something is pressing on the nerve or that something has damaged the nerve from the outside in. And on the other hand, if you had a mainly ischemic insult to the nerve, that would most likely result in pupillary sparing. It's all coming together. And just to round out today's lesson, I wanted to finish by giving you a cheeky little differential list for the cause of cranial nerve three lesions. These are what you would expect. Congenital, due to an embryological development issue or trauma. Acquired, we have vascular, things like ischemia, aneurysms, and cavernous sinus thrombosis. Space occupying lesions, inflammation or infection, trauma, iatrogenic such as post neurosurgery, demyelination and diabetic neuropathy. And out of all of these, ischemia, microvascular ischemia is the most common cause. Of course, this might occur as part of a bigger stroke in the brainstem, in which case you'd expect to find other neurological signs pertaining to other cranial nerves that have been affected or the tracks that run down through the brainstem into the spinal cord. But it's also possible that there's microvascular ischemia that affects just this nerve by itself. So that's something to bear in mind. And it goes without saying that if you come across a cranial nerve three lesion, you want to image the brain to look for the cause and an important cause to look out for is an aneurysm pressing on the nerve because aneurysms can pop and if we know about the aneurysm before it pops then we might be able to intervene and prevent the aneurysm bursting and causing a massive intracranial hemorrhage. 
So the cranial nerve three lesion might be due to an aneurysm, not all the time, but we certainly want to exclude that aneurysm because that aneurysm might lead to bigger problems that we could prevent. So that was lesions of cranial nerve 3, also known as the oculomotor nerve. I hope this helped your studies and your clinical practice. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have a great week. <laughs> Bye!